Hello, this is Jason Green, and in this video, we'll go beyond the dividend discount model to look at the discounted cash flow model as a method for valuing companies. Let's get started. The dividend discount model offers a very basic approach to modeling the value of a stock. In a previous video, I showed how you can set up a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet to do the time value of money calculations to arrive at a stock price. This required forecasting future dividends for the stock. There are other valuation models that make use of the same valuation principles that we used in the dividend discount model. In particular, this video is about the discounted cash flow model, which actually considers the value of the entire firm and then calculates the residual value that's available to shareholders. The discounted cash flow approach is very general, and actually it's quite flexible. There are other intrinsic value models that use modified measures of cash flow to value a firm's stock such as cash flow to equity or earnings-based models. Just as in the dividend discount model, we're going to start with first principles. The value of any asset is simply the present value of an asset's future cash flows. In the discounted cash flow or DCF model, we simply use the firm's free cash flows to calculate the value of the firm. Our approach is to forecast the firm's future free cash flows, and then we'll discount those back using the firm's weighted average cost of capital as our discount rate. This provides the value of the entire firm. And then we calculate the equity value by subtracting out the debt value, since debt holders get paid first. Just as with the dividend discount model, we're going to make year-by-year -year forecast of the cash flows. But this gets very problematic when we go out too far into the future, since we might not have a good idea for long-term cash flows what those year-by-year -year forecasts should be. So we'll focus on making a forecast of the near-term annual cash flows. Beyond that, we're going to forecast a long-term growth rate, or some average annual growth rate, for the cash flows of the firm. This will allow us to forecast a terminal value for the firm, say, five years out. We'll discount those annual cash flows in addition to the terminal value to determine the present value of the firm. You see on the timeline that we're trying to calculate the value at time zero, V sub zero. Indicated there, we have the cash flows in years one through five, and then a value at time five. Again, this value at time five is what we call the terminal value, and it really reflects those future cash flows beyond year five. Before we get into those calculations, I want to acknowledge some complications from the discounted cash flow model. First of all, we're calculating the firm value, not just a stock value. This is one of the model's virtues, since it's not just useful in analyzing stock price. It can also be used by analysts who are concerned about the debt value or the ability of the firm to pay their debts. Another complication is that compared to the dividend discount model, the discounted cash flow model requires forecasts of more complex quantities. Specifically, we'll see that we need to forecast the cash flow of the firm. This is a lot more difficult than just using, say, a dividend per share. Dividends per share, first of all, are fairly smooth through time. We know exactly what they were last period. And we have a pretty good idea of what they'll be, at least over the near future. With cash flows, these come from the overall business of the firm. They have a lot of components. That makes them more difficult to forecast. So in the end, what we end up having to do is use more inputs and make more assumptions. These inputs and assumptions represent what I consider to be the art of security analysis. The time value of money calculations that we'll show in a spreadsheet in just a minute really are the science behind it. The art comes in making forecasts of uncertain quantities, seeing into some crystal ball or seeing into the future. The value that we arrive at at the end is only as good as our forecast and our assumptions. So we have to recognize that as we go into this process that what we come up with in the end is not a precise measurement, rather it's a forecast. Now let's talk about the specific inputs to the discounted cash flow model. First of all, we have to make forecasts of future cash flows. The way we approach this is to first determine a base or initial cash flow. From there, we're going to build our forecast of the future cash flows. I like to split those forecasts up into near and long-term forecasts. The near-term future cash flows we can forecast by thinking of year-over-year -year growth rates. This will give us the year-to-year -year cash flows in the near term. Over the long term, I like to think of starting at the end of that near-term period and applying some average long-term growth rate. 
Of course, to discount these cash flows, we need a discount rate. Since we're using the cash flows to the overall firm and we're calculating a firm-wide value, we need to use the firm's cost of capital, known as the weighted average cost of capital. I like to organize the inputs to the weighted average cost of capital into firm assumptions, market assumptions, equity assumptions, and debt assumptions. Let's start with the firm assumptions. First of all, we need to know the mix of debt and equity. This is the capital structure of the firm. Very simply, we'll look at the market value of the equity and the market value of the debt, and that will tell us the overall market value of the firm and the mix of equity and debt. To get the cost of equity then, we need to first make market assumptions. We need to know what the risk-free rate will be over the long term, the market risk premium over the long term, and then equity-specific assumptions about the equities beta if we're using a capital asset pricing model type approach. To get the cost of debt capital, we need to make assumptions about the pre-tax cost of debt and the effective tax rate because it's the after-tax cost of debt to the firm that we're concerned with. Given all these inputs and forecasts that we have to make, we need some starting point. For those that are measurable, we of course need to find a source that gives us a reliable measure of those inputs. For those that we're forecasting, we need some context from which to forecast. Here I've listed various sources separated into those that are freely available on the web and those that are available from fee-based vendors. Generally speaking, the fee-based vendors aren't offering any information that's not available elsewhere. Rather, they're organizing it in a way that makes it very efficient to use. We'll see that as I do an example using Bloomberg a little later. Let's start with the freely available sources. I've listed the US SEC filings available on Edgar as the first item because in essence, everything that we're doing here relies on the company's financial statements. Those financial statements are filed with the SEC and are available publicly on Edgar. So those are the source documents from which pretty much every other data vendor is drawing that information. So why not go to the source? Other sources such as Google and Yahoo have taken that data and maybe they've organized it so that it's more convenient and more easily accessed. Same thing goes for Morningstar and Bloomberg, and even brokerage firm websites such as Fidelity. All of these have convenient sources of the data that we'll use in our model. All right, now that I've told you about the inputs that we need and where to find these inputs, let's dive right in and build a model in Excel. Here's an Excel template that I built to calculate the discounted cash flow valuation for a company. Before we get started, let me tell you about the layout of this template you'll notice that the background is gray with a yellow box indicating the valuation model. In essence, all the action takes place in the yellow box. But the rest of the spreadsheet is necessary as it has inputs or parameters that go into that valuation calculation, all the inputs that we discussed previously. So let's start filling in some of those assumptions because these are things that will be needed as we do the calculation. Let's start out with our market assumptions. I'm going to enter in a risk-free rate of 3.5% and a market risk premium of 5.5%. Without going into too much detail, I'm relying on long-term market averages for my estimates of the risk-free rate and the market risk premium. For the equity assumptions, I'm going to first enter just a beta of one. This will allow me to calculate the cost of equity capital for this firm. The cost of equity will be the risk-free rate plus the beta times the market risk premium. I'm going to skip the market value of equity right now since we'll first do this with a hypothetical firm. Let's move on to the debt assumptions. The pre-tax cost of debt I'm just going to assume is 4.5% and I'll assume an effective tax rate of 30%. This will allow me to calculate the after-tax cost of debt which is equal to 1 minus the tax rate times the pre-tax cost of debt. Now when we get to the firm assumptions, notice that we first have a firm value. And since it's not a white box, this isn't something we enter. Instead, the firm value is simply the value of the firm's equity plus the value of the firm's debt. At this point, it's zero because we haven't entered any values for the market value of equity or the market value of debt. So at this point, I'm going to go up there and put some placeholders. I'll put in $2 billion for the market value of equity. And I'm initially going to assume this is an all equity firm. Our debt to value ratio then is going to be our debt value divided by the firm value. 
an all equity firm has a 0% debt ratio. Now we'll enter in the formula for the weighted average cost of capital for this firm. The weighted average cost of capital is going to be the weight in equity, which is one minus the debt ratio times the cost of equity, plus the weight of debt, which is the debt ratio, times the cost of debt. The weighted average cost of capital is of course 9%, exactly the same as the cost of equity because it's an all equity firm. If we put in some value, say 200 million, for the amount of debt this firm has, we see the debt ratio go up to 9.09% and the weighted average cost of capital reflect the fact that the cost of debt is lower than the cost of equity. So the weighted average cost of capital goes down to 8.47%. Now we need to get started with the cash flows so that we can use these assumptions about the cost of capital to actually value those cash flows. I'm going to take the approach of putting in $100 as our initial cash flow, and then we'll grow those cash flows over time. Eventually, the firm will enter its terminal growth stage, which I'm going to set right now at 3%. I've chosen 3% just roughly to reflect the long-term growth rate of the overall economy. Now let's go up to the valuation model and start entering in the cash flows. First of all, our initial cash flow should reflect that initial cash flow that we assumed. It's just a formula pointing back to that input value. To get the year one cash flow, we're going to start with the year zero cash flow. But over year zero, we're going to have a growth rate of 10%. So that the year one cash flow will be that initial cash flow times one plus the growth rate over year zero. In this case, $110 million. We'll do that for each year subsequently. I'll just copy and paste that formula down. Of course, the number stays the same because we haven't entered any growth rates in for the other years. I'll start out putting in 10% for each year, at least initially. In year six, this is where the long-term growth rate kicks in. So I'm just going to put in a formula that points back to the input assumption. So we see that 3% appear in year six. Again, this is just a formula pointing back to sell B23. The terminal value takes care of all cash flows that occur after year six. And for this, we'll just rely on the present value of a growing perpetuity formula. The present value of a growing perpetuity is the most recent cash flow times one plus the growth rate, which is 3%, divided by the cost of capital minus the growth rate. So our cost of capital we'll find in cell B21, it's the weighted average cost of capital and we'll subtract off our growth rate. So we see that the value of all future cash flows beyond year six is $3.337 billion. In the total column here, we'll just total up all of our cash flows in terms of e each year's cash flow, including the terminal value. Now, of course, the only year that has the terminal value in it is that last one, but I like to have formulas just copied and pasted so that they're consistent throughout the spreadsheet. The next step is to calculate the present value of each year's cash flow. So I'll take the cash flow divided by, and I'm going to open up two parentheses here. For the present value factor, I'll take one plus the cost of capital. So I'll reference cell B21, but since I'm going to copy and paste this value, I want to put an absolute reference on the weighted average cost of capital cell. So notice the dollar sign in front of the B and in front of the 21. The other thing I'll do is add an exponent to this so that each year, as we go to year two, year three, and so on, we're applying the appropriate discount factor. So we see the present value of that year one cash flow is $101.41 million. We'll copy that down to year two, year three, four, five, and six. To get the total firm value, we'll just sum up the present value of each year's cash flow. This gives us a firm value of approximately $2.7 billion. Now, of course, the firm value is not available to all the firm's shareholders because the debt holders have a senior claim on the firm's assets. So the debt holders must get paid first. So we'll reference the debt value by pointing to cell B16. And for the equity value, we'll take the firm value and subtract out the debt value. 
This is the residual value available to shareholders. Now, to know how much is available to each shareholder, we need to divide by the firm's outstanding shares. How many shares outstanding are there? Let's just assume that there are 100 million shares outstanding, so that the intrinsic value per share will be the equity value divided by the shares outstanding. Each share is worth $24.79. Okay, that's it. That's in essence the science of the discounted cash flow model. We've calculated present values of all the firm's cash flows, we subtracted out the debt value, and found the residual value available to equity holders. Note that we made a bunch of assumptions that went into this, and we can change any of those assumptions, and those assumptions will change the value of the firm. For example, we made a long-term terminal growth rate assumption of 3%. What if the long-term terminal growth rate was only 2.5%? Well, this follows through in our model, and we see that the intrinsic value per share goes down to $22.99. That makes sense. The slower the firm grows, the less cash flows are available to shareholders, and that means less intrinsic value. Let me put that back up to 3%, so we go back to our base value of $24.79. Instead of changing that terminal growth rate, let's change the growth rate each year up to that point where that terminal growth rate kicks in. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start setting all of these to zero. So what if the firm started out with a free cash flow of $100 million, and that free cash flow never grew until we got to the terminal growth stage? We see that the firm value is actually worth about $14.12, less than half of what we thought before. This shows how near-term growth is very important in determining the value of the firm. Again, changing these growth rates changes the value available to shareholders. If I put in 5%, the value goes up, in this case, to $18.86. These growth rates on a year-by-year -year basis are really what analysts spend a lot of time trying to forecast for a firm. What are the firm's cash flows going to be each year? And you notice as I change these growth rates each year, in essence, I'm making a forecast for the free cash flow for that year. So if I change the growth rate in year zero to 10%, Instead of having a year one cash flow of $105 million, I have a year one cash flow of $110 million. That becomes the basis on which the next year's growth applies. Now that we've seen how to build a basic discounted cash flow valuation model, please watch the next video in which we apply the DCF model to a real firm. And we look at the different sources of data as we try to find the inputs to the model for that real firm.